And we're going to talk about separation a little bit today. And that's a lost subject in the body of Christ. Nobody wants to be separated from the world. They want to be part of the world. <clears throat> but you can't be. You can't be part of the world and serve God. You can't do it. So we're going to take a look at what Paul says about that. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. We've got it up on the board here. 2 Corinthians. We're going to start on uh, chapter 6. Separation. Salvation and separation go together. Salvation and separation and also the lordship of Jesus ends up with separation. Okay? You can't serve God unless you're separated from the world. Now, we are in the world because we have to live in the world. We were placed in the world. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. We don't have the spirit of the world. We don't. We don't have that. Okay? Now, Paul is talking to the church of Corinth. <clears throat> Beginning on verse 1, we're going to go 1 through 3, then we're going to skip down to verse 11. And working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now, I'm not going to get off on that, but I just want to say he's telling us that you can receive the grace of God in vain. And that's a frightening thought. Unless you are on God spiritually all the time, you will flub up. You will get mad. You'll lose out with what God wants to do. You have to be on God all the time. All right. So do not receive the grace of God in vain, for he says, at the acceptable time, I listen to you. And on the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, I want you to notice this. I'm, just, I'm not going to say too much about this, but God does things at a time and a place. That's one of the reasons why some prayers are not answered immediately. Other prayers are answered immediately. But there's timing in God. There's timing in God. And God is looking to accomplish things in our lives. Not just to answer our prayers. He's doing many other things at one time. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. And uh, last week we had Brother, Brother Clark here with us. We had a great time. We didn't get out of here till 2 o'clock anyway. It was 2 o'clock when we got out of here. But I want to say this. Uh, God did something for me that I didn't even ask for. But it was a healing. I went home and I noticed something. I said, gee, this is different than before. And uh, God did it. Say Hallelujah. Now, that was to do with this, being in the presence of God at the right time and the right place. You're going to get something that you don't even need to ask for. You don't have to beg God. You just have to be in his presence. And the presence was thick here last week. It was thick this morning, too. Thank you, Jesus. The presence of God is moving here. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. So what you're going to see more and more in this church as we wait on God in the presence and let him move, people will get touched without asking for anything. That's right. That is how God works. Say hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And so I just want to you, help you understand that. You don't have to partition God for everything. Sometimes he'll heal, heal you without even asking for it. If you're in the right time and the right place and in the right attitude and everything lines up and you've got faith, boom, you'll get it. Say hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. It's powerful. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Back to the word. All right. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> At the acceptable time, I listen to you. 
and on the day of salvation I helped you. Exactly. Behold, now is the acceptable time, and behold, now is the day of salvation. And notice from Hebrews chapter 1, faith is now. Faith is always now. One of the reasons prayers are not answered as quickly as we want is God's trying to get you lined up in some other area of your life to line up with the Word of God. When you line up with the Word, everything falls into place. Say hallelujah. The healings move. The salvations occur. People get changed when you're lined up with the Word of God. All right. Back to the Word. Verse 3. Now, he's saying, I'm giving you this teaching, giving no cause for offense in anything in order that the ministry be not discredited. Now, he's going to go in and he's going to come down on them and he's going to say, you're going to have to get separated from the world. He's going he's to tell them, get separated. But he's going to say, I'm not trying to offend you. You've got to be in a position where you don't offend other people. Paul's saying, I'm not offending you. I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to love you. But you have to receive what I'm saying. All right. Back to the word. Back to verse 11 here now. Our mouth has spoken freely to you, O Corinthians. Our heart is opened wide. You are not restrained by us. We're not holding you back. But you are restrained by your own affections. Now, in a new, in a uh, now in a like exchange, I speak as to children. Open wide to us also. Notice he says, in a like exchange, he's saying, talk to us. If you don't understand what we're saying. Talk to us. Communicate. We're going to have an exchange here. And then I'm going to explain to you what's going on. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And that's always the Holy Spirit. After a while, the Holy Spirit will explain things to you. He'll show you things, things you don't understand. He'll make it, he'll turn the light on for you. He'll make it reality. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Yes. <clears throat> I speak, verse 13, excuse me, 12. You are not restrained by us, you are, <clears throat> but you are restrained by your own affections. 13. Now, in a like exchange, I speak as to children. Open wide to us also. In other words, open your heart up. How do you talk to children? Through their heart. Through their heart. Okay? You don't really approach their brain. They're not there yet. You have to approach their affections. You have to talk to their affections, their feelings. Amen. Some people never get past that. If you can't speak to them in their feelings, they won't ever hear. They, their brain's been shut off forever. And they're just afraid to turn it back on. They don't want to think. And so you have to approach them very gently, very gently, and you have to show them love. This is what Paul's saying. I'm, I'm loving you. I'm speaking to you like children. Take it easy. Don't get all bent out of shape. Now, this was related to the teaching that he gave them back in the first book of uh, Corinthians about the man who was having sexual relations with his stepmother. This is what it's all about. And he said, get rid of him, throw him out. He said, he doesn't belong in the church, get him out. And then here he says, take him back in. Forgive him. If he's ready to be forgiven, forgive him. Say hallelujah. Amen. That's what the church does. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Back to the word. <clears throat> now, here is the instruction he's going to give. It's straight down the line. Do not be bound or tied or tethered together with unbelievers. For what partnership does righteousness or has righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? So he says right off the bat, be careful who you make your friend, who your friends are. Now remember I said, 
We have to live in this world. God understands that. And we have to make a living. And we have to get up every morning and rub shoulders with a lost and dying world. But he says, be careful who you make a partnership with. Now, he's talking about business. He's talking about marriages. Years ago, we heard a lot of sermons on being unequally yoked. And this is what he's talking. This is the terminology right here. Do not be unequally yoked. Do not make agreements with people that don't serve God. Be very careful. Be very careful about that. And he's going to say, bad company corrupts good morals. You can have morally pure, morally perfect, but if you're hanging out with the wrong crowd, you will be affected. You will be. You can just, you can count on it. It'll affect you. All right? So he starts on this subject of be careful who you're going to make agreements with. Let's go back to the book here now. Do not be bound. Bound together, okay? Tied together, as I said before. Tied, all right? <clears throat> For what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness? That's true. What right, what, how does righteousness work with lawlessness? How does the devil, he's going to get down here, he's going to say, how does Satan work with Jesus? It's impossible. It's impossible. You can't be tied to unbelievers. It is the truth. That's right. It's written. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. That's right. Now, remember I said... You have to earn a living. You have to go to work. You have to get out in the real world. But you have to be very careful about how close you get to them and to their social, social life and to who they are and to what's going on in their life. You've got to be very, very careful because you'll be affected by it. You'll be affected by it. Amen. God began to show me this, well, oh, maybe 10 years ago. I had to be very careful who I was with and what was going on. Very careful. All right, back to the word. <clears throat> what partnership does righteousness and lawlessness have? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Verse 15. Or what harmony has Christ with Belial, which is Beelzebub, which is a demon? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever. That's right, yeah. Now, <clears throat> the city of Corinth had all kinds of pagan rituals, all kinds of pagan rituals. And uh, I gotta be careful here, but I just wanna say this. A lot of the feasts that we have now, starting in the summer, going into the fall, originally were all pagan. How many of you understand that? All the Portuguese feasts, all the Italian feasts, all the Eng feasts in England, all the feasts all over Europe. What the church did was just put a saint on it. Boom, that's it. And everybody did the same thing they had always been doing for hundreds of years. Go to the feast every fall, have a good time. Really eat too much and drink too much. That's really what it was. It was uh, an overindulgence. So, years ago, when I was a child, a lot of the old uh, Spanish and the Italian Pentecostals wouldn't go to the feasts. I don't know if you, I know Brother Dan remembers that. They preached against it. They preached against it because all the food was offered to the idols. All food was offered to idols, okay? So they wouldn't go near it. Nowadays, we've backed off on that. We just say, look, you know, you bless it before you eat it. You better pray over it yourself before you eat it. You know, if you want to go and eat, good. Go ahead, go. But understand that in the mind of the unsaved, there's other things going on. There's other things going on. So there was a separation line, an early Pentecost on these issues, a separation, a big separation. And the people were not encouraged to ever go. And... Uh, 
a friend of mine who was uh, happened to be an elder in our church years ago, uh, in Brooklyn said to me, uh, my father-in-law used to get mad that I went to the feast. He said, I used to say, Pop, take it easy. I pray over everything I eat. Plus, uh, the cannolis are fresh over there. <laughs> so, uh, he was eating, but he was going for the right reason. He knew it had nothing to do with any, any spiritual thing at all. It was simply a thing that I wanted to enjoy. Say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. So, that was true in the city of Corinth. That happened all the time. And people have to understand that, and you have to understand that too. We have no association with the world. We have to be very careful. And this is, this is like walking on eggshells all the time because we have to be careful where we go, be careful what we say, be careful how we act, be careful what we are representing. We're representing Jesus. Say hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. I was in uh, on the Azores a long time ago, probably 20 years ago. We were doing some evangelistic work in the Azores. And uh, I was driving around, and I came through this town by the name of Villafranca do Campo. Villafranca do Campo, next to the ocean. Very pretty town, right on the side of the water. And um, here we're going along 50 miles an hour, and all of a sudden... The traffic has stopped dead. Dead. Wasn't even creeping, just a little bit, creeping a little bit. And uh, I said to the person that was riding with me from the church, I said, go find out what's going on. I can't speak Portuguese. Go find out what's going on. He came back. He said, it's the feast. The feast is on. That's it. They're shutting down. I said, well, we got to get around this thing. We got to get around this feast. He said, uh, good luck. I don't think you're going anywhere. So it's the truth. So I got out. We were talking to everybody. I said, I got to get around. He said, no, 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 no. Before you go through the town, you have to stop and have some food to eat. The truth. They were forcing everybody. They were taking them under the tent. They had stew and they had soup and they had all kinds of stuff. You know, dunk your bread and the whole thing. And, you know, exactly. You know, they were, unfortunately, they were drinking wine glasses, water glasses full of wine. And they poured me this big thing. I said, no, 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 no. Oh, no, you got to have this. I said, no, no, no. I'll eat a little of this. I ate a little bit. I had a Coke, and finally I gave the wine to somebody else. And, uh, but anyway, uh, it was a feast, and they were having a good time, and they wanted everybody to celebrate with them. So I did, not to offend them, see? Not to offend them. That's the deal. I didn't want to offend anybody. And God wants us, he doesn't want us to offend, you see? So I just thank God for that. But it was a strange circumstance, very strange. You know, it was like the feast of, uh, I don't know, the Holy Spirit. I think it was the Holy Spirit. I think it was the feast of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and uh, uh, I felt, well, hey, it can't be too bad. It's the Holy Ghost, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. But anyway, what I'm saying is, we have to be careful where we walk, what we say, what we do. Now, different cultures have different sets of things that are right and wrong. But God expects us to understand right off the bat what's going on. Okay? You have to discern that. In the spirit, you have to discern what's right and what's wrong. Say hallelujah. Glory to God. All right. Back to the word. Back to the word. <sighs> or what agreement has the temple of God, verse 16, excuse me, I'm going to do the latter portion of verse 15, Belial, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? That's right. Now, all idols, and I want you to understand this, all idols are demon Demon, demon, demons. That's what they are. All idols are demons. Anything that comes into your life that becomes an idol, a demon is behind it. A demon is behind it. Get this. Get a hold of this. This is why God wants us to be separate from the world. Because there's demons floating around everywhere. Okay? So anything that would separate you from God becomes a demon. Even when it's good, even when it's good, 
It can be misused. All right. Back to the word. Here we go. <clears throat> Idols. For we are, we are the temple of the living God. Now, he says so many things so quickly here. He makes statements. Idols, demons. We, what are we? We are the temple of the living God. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Come on. Come on. Thank you, Lord. We've got the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. We don't have a demon there. We've got the Holy Spirit in there. Now, I want to say this. There could be areas in your life that you struggle with, and that's where the demons are. God expects you to overcome in everything. He expects you to overcome in your life in every single situation. Any situation that overcomes you regularly, that's demonic. Come on. This is where we're at here. This is what's going on. So he expects you to be an overcomer. An overcomer. Say hallelujah. An overcomer all the time in every place. Thank you, Lord. Come on. An overcomer. That's right. This is powerful. Why? Because Christ died that we would overcome. That's why he's dead. That's why he rose again, that we might become an overcomer. Come on, give the Lord a hand. Amen. All right, now he's going to get into some meaty stuff right here. <clears throat> Just as God said, verse 16, I will dwell in them and walk among them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, this is taken from the Old Covenant, all right? This is taken from the Old Testament. This is where he's pulling this from, all right? <clears throat> Exodus 17. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. Come out from among them. That's the way the King James says it. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Okay? And do not touch what is unclean. Do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you. I will welcome you. And finally, I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Say hallelujah. Come on. Amen. How many of you have ever wondered about the justice of God when you read the Old Testament and he tells Israel to annihilate the, the nations in Canaan. Lift your hands up. You ever wonder if God is just? Sure, it's natural. It's natural. What right does God have to do to have to annihilate those people? And he says to them, go in and kill every living being. Kill every single living being. Men, women, children. All the animals. Destroy them all. And then when you read it, you get horrified. What kind of a God is this? What's going on here? The world could never accept that. They don't have to because they don't know what's going on anyway. All right? They had reached the point where sin was up to its limit. Sin has a limit. Sin has a limit. Remember this. Sin has a limit. God limits sin. This is the way God explained it to Abraham. When the cup is full, they'll be judged. This is what he told them. Now, God said to Abraham, in 400 years, I'm going to give you this land. And then he explained it to Abraham. He said, when their, their cup is not full yet, but in 400 years, they will have gone past the point of no return, and I will eliminate them. That's a bad place to be. How many of you know that? When you've gone past the point of no return, where God can't 
touch you, where he can't reach you, we can't bring you back. So God spoke this to Abraham. So Abraham understood, in his spirit, he understood that there would be a time and place where his offspring would dispossess the others and go in and take the land. He knew that. He understood that. That was no, that was no mystery for him. But when it came Moses 400 years later, then it was time to carry it out. And they had to dispossess the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, and all the other ites. And they destroyed them all. They destroyed them all. You know why? Because God was finished with them. God was finished. They had their chance. They had their time. And God was finished with them. And he knew they were never going to come back. And he knew he couldn't reconcile them back to himself. Because in order for him to do it, you would have to have Jesus. Jesus is the reconciler. So, and it was before he couldn't do that, so he destroyed them. And why did he destroy them? Because of idols. Because of idolatry. Because idolatry had an effect on his people. Worship with idolatry, even in the, in, in the city of Corinth, all had to do with fornication and lust. You had temple prostitutes. Temple prostitution. Imagine having sexual relations with somebody and giving the money to God. That's what was going on. That's what was going on. And now you know how God detested it and he hated it. And then, not only did you have females, normal sexuality, you had abnormal sexuality. You had male temple prostitutes. And that was done for the glory of their God. Now guess what? God hates all that, and he hates it, and he des despises it because it's against his creation and how he created things. It goes directly against creation. Thank you, Lord. So, what did he say? You're going, to you're going to destroy everything. You're going to take it all out. So when, you come, when I put you in the land, we're going to start over again. But Israel fought the temptation of idolatry. Every time they slipped up, it was idols. Every time they slipped up, they lost, they got, they'd lose their possession, and God would give it back to them. God would give it back, and they'd lose it again. It was all idols. That's why God took the idols out in the beginning. He took the idols out so they wouldn't be a temptation to Israel. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Every time. Finally, it was time for them to lose possession of the land totally. In 586 B.C., they lost possession of the land to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar came in and pushed Judah out. Now, Israel had already gone into captivity already in 622, all right? Now it was time for Judah to go into captivity. They went into captivity in Babylon, when they came out 70 years later, they never really went back into deep sin, into deep idolatry like they had before. They never did. God has a way of making it so painful when he wants to teach you a lesson. So painful, so, dis so distasteful, so horrible, so embarrassing when they lost everything. They never really fully went back. Say, thank you, Jesus. Now, a lot in their culture did, but as a group, they never went back to idolatry. Say hallelujah. God has a way of taking sin out of us. You get caught in a trap, he'll take it out. Say hallelujah. Glory to God. So he's talking about being separated from the world. A lot of people get frightened when we talk about being separated from the world. They don't want to hear that. I want to be like everybody else. I want to look like everybody else. I want to, you can't. You can't look, act, talk, think like it. You can't. 
The battle in this country is to control your mind. But when you stay in the word, God will control your mind. God will control your thinking. God will control how you operate. God will control what you do. God will control what you say. When you're in the word, you're going to be okay. Say, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. So he said, my people, the book of Exodus, are going to be separated from the world. This was the process of Passover, taking Israel out of Egypt. When God took Israel out of Egypt, he separated Israel from Egypt. Now, they didn't want to go live in the wilderness, in the desert. They didn't want to do that. Of course, they wanted to stay uh, in the surroundings that were uh, understandable and familiar to them. Stay in familiar surroundings. He stuck them in a wilderness. And what happened? He made them trust him. He made them live a life of faith. He made them walk their existence out in faith. And truly, when you serve God, you will walk your life in faith. Say hallelujah. You will. There'll be things you don't understand. You won't understand what God is doing. But you know that God is in charge, and you know you're going to keep walking anyway, whether you understand it or you don't. Hallelujah. That's right. You're going to walk it out. Glory to God. God expects the church to be separated from the world. He expects that. Separation goes along with salvation. Say that. Separation, salvation. Salvation, separation. Separation, salvation. They go together. They do. Amen. Years ago, we understood this in, in early Pentecost because once you joined the Pentecostal churches and you began to worship there, you were automatically tagged the Holy Roller. Boop! That's gone. They're part of that weird crowd down the street. That doesn't happen anymore. In the last 50 years, we haven't had to work with that. No problem with that. But guess what? We've lost something in 50 years. We've lost a lot. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So... Don't ever worry about somebody putting a tag on you. Who cares? As long as you're separated unto God, God will take care of you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God will take care of you. Yes, he will. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. You're never, ever, ever going to fit in a world system. We're never going to fit in a world system. We never will. We never will. But God knows about that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to fit in his system and his people and his body, the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord. Stand with me.